All right, welcome everybody to the July fun office hours. Um, today I'm going to be going over uh, some of the latest developments regarding Fortran templates, which are going to be uh, added to the next revision of the Fortran standard. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the other features that are slated to be added to the next okay. revision. So um, I gave this presentation last week to the Fortran Standards Committee as kind of you know an update to them on where the the subgroup that's developing this feature, uh, you know what what our progress has been and what does the syntax look like. And at the last meeting, we officially passed an approved version of the syntax. So now we're just on the actual edits to the standards to get this this feature included as part of the language. Um, but this, so this should be kind of a, just a high level, hey, what is this stuff going to look like? Um, the, the kind of, you know, use cases and, you know, what, what is the feature supposed to be capable of type stuff for background is, you know, we want to be able to write some generic algorithms that just work for, you know, any type, any kind, that kind of stuff. So things like I want to be able to swap the values into variables or I want to write something that looks like one of the intrinsics, like findloc or maxval or something like that, but you know, work on my own derived types. Um, sorting and searching algorithms are usually pretty general regarding you know wh whatever type is in your array or what have you. Like the the operations are still pretty general. Like I, I need greater than and less than, and and then I just move stuff around, right? So the, the types and kinds are are not generally specific to, to the algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, and even some numerical algorithms are fairly general, like a matrix solver could work on real or um, some differential equation solver that can work on different kinds of reals, you know, th those kinds of things. The other thing is, you know, some, some of the standard data structure kinds of things, um, colloquially termed containers like vector and set or, uh, you know, and then there's multiple terms for this, this idea, but like uh, an associative array or a map or a dictionary, the different languages kind of use a different term for that, but I've got some sort of a key and I want, and that refers to some particular value. Um, the, the requirements that we kind of gave ourselves as we were coming up with the, the feature was, well, we're pretty sure we want to have named templates. Um, we want full type safety within the templates. Um, other languages have termed this strong concepts, but the, the idea is there should be a large degree to which the compiler can verify that yeah. the template code itself is self-consistent and that will work on any valid, anytime that it's instantiated with value, valid uh, parameters, that that template is going to work. Um, and then to facilitate like kind of uh, reuse of the declarations that, you know, define the requirements of uh, the valid parameters for a template, we wanted something that we could give names to those sets of requirements. And then, and one of the interesting ones was that duplicate types are the same type. So in Fortran, if you in two different modules define what looks like exactly the same derived type, it had the same name, the same components in the same order, you know, the syntax is I copy pasted one from the other. Those are actually considered by the language to be different derived types. But when it comes to templates, if I, if I write the derived type in one place and I instantiate it, uh, that template that defines that derived type with the same arguments, I want the two types to actually be considered the same type, not distinct. Um, so that there was a that's an interesting feature that that gets uh, snuck in there a little bit. Um, so you know the design goals, uh, and feel free to you know ask questions if if you have any. Uh, so the design goals were, you know, that the compilers 
to the degree possible, able to ensure that the template is self-consistent, specifies what makes a valid combination of arguments, and that it's easy to write templates that work with both derived types and intrinsic types. Uh, and that the template doesn't end up dictating the spelling of code that's going to use it, at least to the extent possible. Um, so what does the syntax look like that we came up with? Um, the, the requirement block, uh, which kind of gives name, you know, a named, a named thing that is a collection of, uh, template, uh, de template argument declarations, uh, you, you give it a list of arguments and then and then you can include some declarations. And then if you want to reuse those, uh, the requires <coughs> statement lets you say, uh, the those declarations apply to these <coughs> arguments. So in this example, you end up being a deferred type, F ends up being a function. Oh, I forgot to add a keyword there. One second, I'm gonna fix that right yes. now. Deferred interface. The last second, we change the syntax just a smidge. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not good. There we go. Um, so, and then, so f is a deferred function. So what happens when you want to instantiate that template, you give a type for what you, you give a type for you and a function and we, we extended the language a little bit to say, well, you can also use intrinsic operators or generic names. And because you had to have declared the interface to what, what you want to pass, it can do the generic resolution on instantiation and say, oh, you wanted, you wanted plus for integers. So I can, I can pass that as a function. Um, and then as a shorthand, we also said, well, if you add another pair of arguments to a function or a subroutine definition, though this is considered a template function. Um, <laughs> and you can instantiate and call it kind of in line. And for now, we've got this extra little caret symbol just as an extra, just kind of as an indicator that, hey, this is a template that I'm instantiating. And then the second, parentheses says the arguments to the function, what that I actually want to call. So that's kind of the the, the syntax ends up looking like. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, hi, Brad. Oh. I, I have a question about this. Uh, um, you, you put here this requirement to this. Uh, this is not, a, 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 actually, that look familiar with me as a way of for trying to write. So normally you either this is has to be a like function or you have to have something in this requirement. This, this is a like a sub team or what what exactly this is? It's a it's a place to put declarations that you want to reuse. So this is a new kind of like a command in a Fortran, the new Fortran? The new construct. Okay, the... I see. So so there has to be a requirement. If anything, if you want to put it under below. You do not have to use this feature, but it very quickly becomes useful because you'd end up templates. You, you very quickly find that different templates would end up with repeated declarations of a fairly decent sized okay. list of arguments that look identical. And so this ends up being very quickly a, a quick way of reusing what would otherwise be a pretty verbose set of declarations. I see. If we're into the function. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we worked through kind of a simple example. Um, basically ax plus y. So I've got I've got this function that takes a mm -hmm. scalar a, an array x, and another array of the same size y, and does a times x plus y to return another another array of the same size as the inputs. Um, this function works pretty much no matter what these declarations are, this line is valid, right? Um, so how can we make this more generic so that we don't have to copy paste and write, oh, here's axb for double precision, and then here's axb for integers and yada yada. 
Um, so we can kind of do this in, in steps, in, in small steps. The first one is let's just make this agnostic to which kind of real. Yeah. And so what, what you can do is, oh, we changed the spelling of that too. Deferred parameter is the way we spelled it. So you add an extra set of arguments to make this a templated function. Uh, and we give it a deferred integer parameter k, right? So this says that k is a constant, but I haven't said what its value is yet. But given that it's a constant, I can use it as the kind parameter for real. So I can say all of these, all of these will be the same kind of real, but I haven't defined what kind that is yet. But regardless, knowing that it's real, I can do times and plus, and this works. And so then when I want to call it, I've got a uh, single precision and double precision defined for my kind parameters. Then I can define some arrays that are single precision real, some arrays that are double precision real. And then I can inline instantiate and call for single precision or double precision. And this, this works now, right? So now, now I haven't had to repeat this just to add support for double precision. Yeah, G. And um, here I see this, you call it simple function. Is that simple also is a, is a name has to be used in a Fortran because in, I, I'm not familiar with the simple. Oh, is, it, is a new uh, attribute for procedures as of Fortran 2023. Oh, I see. It, it says that the procedure is not allowed to modify or refer to anything other than its arguments. Oh, I see. Okay, this this is new to me. It, okay. it enables a lot of optimization and in fact enables a lot of maintainability. If I see that keyword, I know that I don't have to go searching for all of the module variables that this thing modifies. I see. So, no, it only touches its arguments. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next step is, can we make the that function now agnostic to the type as well as the kind? And the answer is yes. Uh, it now takes uh, a couple of extra arguments for the template arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to write again. So this this is where this you know requirement functionality becomes useful because I would have had to define the same interface twice. Right, plus mm -hmm. and times at the exact same interface, but I can write the interface once and then reuse it by saying I need a binary operator that works on a type. Oh. Two. It needs to be a simple elemental function that takes two arguments of type T and returns a type T. Now I can say requires bin op T plus and requires bin op <laughs> T times. And I can say I need plus and times. <laughs> Or whichever type you're going to use. Mm -hmm. um, rest the rest of the declarations all stay the same. I have to switch around the uh, the expression here to call those functions instead of using directly plus and times because I don't I don't know that T has a plus and a times. <laughs> you have to give me functions that correspond to those. Um, but once you've done that, now uh, now I can also declare an arrays of integers. <laughs> Now I can call the same, the exact same function on the arrays of integers by saying integer and operator plus and star still still work. I can just pass those as as the function arguments. Um, and can we go even further? Uh, Axby actually works if the operands aren't all of the same type. So turns out we can go one step further. Um, my requirement changes to now have three types. <coughs> type of the first argument, the type of the second argument, and the return type. And then my and then my requirements, uh, my my template now says, well now I need now I actually need five different types. I need what's the type of A, what's the type of X, what's the type of Y, what's the type of the result when you multiply A and X, and what's the type of the result when you add that to Y. Um, 
Uh, and that requirement then again comes back into play and is actually I have to like coordinate mm -hmm. a x and the result type of the mul multiplication for that function and then the times result type y type and the plus result type for plus and so a x and y and then the type of the result is the result of the plus operation so this is now fully general and I can call mixed XB where A is real, X is integer and Y is double precision by saying that by um, instanti I, in this instance, I've instantiated it ahead of time and for standalone template procedures is the name of this, this feature. Um, when you instantiate them ahead of time using an instantiate statement, you have to give them a new name. So I give it a new name. That that way, the name of the function and the name of the template aren't the same, because other, otherwise they're kind of considered to have the same name. But anyway, um, so I give type of A, type of X, type of Y. The, the result from it multi multiplying an integer and a real is a real, and result of then uh, adding that to double precision is double precision. The intrinsic operators work on those mixed types, so I can still just pass them directly, and then I can print mixed XB, right? So with this, you can take existing algorithms and incrementally kind of make them more general without ha and support you know new types and kinds without having to rewrite your functions. Um, then we had another example, um, talked a little bit about containers at the beginning. Uh, so one more example was what's something you might want to do with things in like a, a vector, for example. Um, I might want to print all the things in that container out. If you have come from a handful of other languages, you will have seen a pattern like this, where you'd say, I've got some container, I want to know if I'm going to iterate over it, you know, go through the elements one at a time, I need to know what's the last thing and what's the first thing. And then when I haven't gotten to the end, when it, I'm going to print the thing in that position and then I'm going to move to the next thing, right? So this, this is a common pattern that you've seen in, in other languages. Can we do this in a kind of type agnostic way? And the answer again is yes, now we can with templates. So I add again that second list of arguments to, to the procedure. So I need to know what are the types of things in the container? What is the container's type? And what is the type that I'm using for iteration? Uh, then I need some procedures that tell me what the begin and end are. Uh, I need equality and some sort of equality operation for iterator, the iterator type. I need a procedure that can advance the iterator. And I need a procedure that can give me an item that corresponds to that iterator. And then something that knows how to print the thing that I'm trying to print, right? So then we go through all the declarations for all these things. Um, those three types are deferred. The interfaces for those procedures, again, a function that takes uh, a container and returns the iterator corresponding to the beginning, same for the end, uh, a quality operation on iterators to tell me, am I done yet? Uh, given a container and an iterator, it increment that iterator. Uh, given a container and an iterator, give me the item corresponding to that position, and given an item, print it out. Please. <laughs> so then we can define a container that itself can work on things of any type. So the simplest example is something like vector from other languages like C++ or maybe lit, you'd call it list if you're coming from Python, but the idea is I can hold on to a list of things. Um, 
you can kind of imagine what the, the begin, end, and next, and item functions would look like. Begin's going to take a, uh, be begin's just going to return an it the integer one. End is going to be the last, how, how big is my, my list? Next is going to take the iterator and just add one to go to the next item in the list. An item is going to say, given the index, give me the item at that position in the array. Right, so the the implementation for those is relatively straightforward. Um, but then we can instantiate a vector of integers, and given a subroutine print integer, we can instantiate and call print the things in this integer vector. But it also then works for reals. I, I don't have to rewrite. A, cont a vector of reals, and I don't have to rewrite how to print the things in a vector of reals. Like all of these things just start to work together. And then you can go one step further and make things really interesting and start to use polymorphism. Um, so if you say that a deferred type is abstract, you can say that it is class T allocatable. And so with a little, the simple little wrapper type that says that it's going to to uh, and and then say uh, an abstract shape type that says it will anything of this type will know how to convert itself into a string and let's say you know instantiate this polymorphic wrapper so now i have a type who can hold on to a thing that is a type that i don't even know what types might be possible yet but i do know that they can know how to convert themselves into a string I can instantiate a vector of those and print out a vector of them where the print function I need is just given that wrap given an item of that wrapper type. I can refer to the item inside and call to string on it, even though I don't know what it's going to be. All of this code actually still works, and I haven't even told you that, and at this point. This will all compile and work. You don't even know what types of shape there are yet. So this gives us real, uh, real powerful flexibility that a lot of other languages have really started to add for capabilities of you know, making generic code that just works with pretty much anything. Um, so any other questions on, on templates? and some of these examples. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, um, yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, my, my question is, uh, how is this going to be useful in a scientific commu computing community? The, the way I envision it being most useful, the the soonest is you've got some library that does, for example, um, differential equation solving, right? It works yeah. on it works on reals, right? The whole the whole thing is written in terms of real, concretely the real single precision. Well, but somebody comes along and says, but my problem really needs the accuracy of double precision. Well, you don't want to go rewrite the whole library, right? You don't want to copy paste and change all the declarations. No. You want to support both at the same time without having to copy paste. Well, you just put template around it and say that the, there's a kind parameter and now Sir A can instantiate it for reals and user B can instantiate it for double precision and then the whole thing still works. Right? That that's gonna be the 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 simplest first changes that we start to see is people just putting template around existing code and making it kind and not. Do you need a template? I think it will use like a like kind, we define kind and then so that's just a one variable, at least in a function because by... kind, kind cannot be a variable. I say we have to. It has to be a constant. So, at the time that you're compiling 
the library, that constant has to be defined, which means right. it different for two different users. Oh, I see. You mean like a different user? Coded, right? You're hard coded to that, yes. that right. constant. Well, now you're saying that it's constant, but you're saying somebody else will provide that constant later. Mm. I see. So you mean basically different users, say if someone wants like double precision, someone wants single precision, and you can buy whatever they, they use. And, and five years from now, when everybody decides we really need the, 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 the accuracy of quad precision, nobody has to rewrite their libraries yet again. Right? Sure. Sure. <laughs> oh, my, my platform supports quad precision. And I've got some optimized library for that. And now I just passed quad precision. And now your library works with quad precision. And you never even had to think about it. Yeah, actually, recently, I'm encountering a, a problem. Not a problem. I'm using quad precision. But I mm -hmm. found, actually, the quad precision costs to like a factor of 10 slower than a double precision, even more than a well, factor of 10. Yeah, that I'm In not the um most quad precision math is done in software. The hardware doesn't support it. I see. Because, but it's it's an intrinsic, uh, I, I mean, it's a support, uh, like uh, the Fortran su support this quad precision, right? Uh -huh. uh, right. But the hardware doesn't natively support quad precision. So there has to be an extra runtime library that does the operations for quad precision. It takes right. extra it takes extra cycles. There's extra logic involved in keeping all the bits in the right order and things like that, right? Whereas yeah. with the, the hardware can do the intrinsic oper multiply operations in a single clock cycle, right? Right. I, I, I'm surprised with the fact that you, I just added my the the change is not a big. Is mm -hmm. basically I have to take a square root of some some number. And then take a, like a minus of two. So I have like a two, a, a, a bunch of quad, quadruple precision, uh, mm -hmm. three variables to take a square root and then a, a minus. Uh, so the, so it's not very complicated uh, function. Mm -hmm. and they, it, it's, uh, I'm surprised that the actually timing, uh, it takes more than a factor of, I think it's about a factor of 20 or 30 or it's, it's much, it's a big factor. Um, in, by using this uh, intrinsic uh, uh, quad precision, I, I look. I I started to look at this. Uh, David Bailey has this uh, library to quad quad precision, but I didn't get a chance to to check his package yet. But I just want to 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 uh, maybe, maybe that's what uh, I, I'm a little bit surprised. I was thinking basically to check with you. Maybe you 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 know a little bit more, or, or it's just sounds sounds like it's normal to be much fast, much slower than the double yeah. precision. I mean, there, there was a, a time in the transition from 32-bit to 64-bit machines where double precision was implemented in software and was four to 10 times slower, right? I see. Right. It's just we're going through the same phase again. Uh, but maybe we'll start seeing machines that have some hardware support for 128-bit. I don't know, but maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. But there, there is the point to be made that changing the software that uses quad precision was easy in Fortran because you just change that kind type parameter. Right. right. And things just work. Whereas if you were in a language like C or C, you may not even get the option, right? <laughs> Don't they have like a long double in a C or C? Uh, maybe they do. But again, all of their declarations probably say double. So you have to go change all of the declarations. Right. For Fortran, with the kind functionality, you go change one constant that says what my kind, what kind of real am I using? And it's yes. propagated yeah. everywhere. And it will be yeah. much e easier yet again to just support all the real kinds when we have templates. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, 
The other thing I wanted to talk about, unless anybody else had questions on templates. Um, the other thing I thought I'd uh, present a little bit on is um, we now officially kind of know the list of things that are going to be added to the next revision of the standard. Um, so as of last week, we the, the committee voted on it. We said these are the things that we're going to do for the next revision of the standard. So far, it's codenamed 2020Y. Our official plan is to have it published late 2028. I wouldn't be surprised if that slips a year, but that's the, the plan is 2028. Um, so here's the list of all of the features that uh, that we're going to be adding. Um, I did go over a decent chunk of this list uh, after the meeting last year. So if you go find the recording from that, um, there's a lot more details on some of the some of the earlier items. I think up to generic programming templates. Uh, maybe up to like that that one. Uh, the rest of the list that was already is already had already been decided, and so you can go uh, find the previous recording for some of the details on some of those. Um, one of the interesting ones is to make default implicit typing obsolete. So with newer compilers adopting this, you won't have to say implicit none anymore. It will just be the default. Um, let's see. Um, there's going to be some work on asynchronous tasks. So somewhat uh, to how Sorry, uh, Brad. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you say like implicit uh, uh, that become uh, obsolete, does mm -hmm. that mean, so right now basically we, we use implicit none. So then right. we have to declare every variable. So, Correct. Uh, right, but you have to so, say implicit none or the compiler doesn't enforce that, right? Right. So now you mean, so then without that one, because Fortran used to be kind of like, a, there is a, um, yeah, you don't was. have to declare. So there is, so it's not, it's, it's Fortran is different from C, right? Or C++, or C++ you have, in C or C++, you have to declare every variable. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, either integer or double or whatever. Yeah. But in, in Fortran, by default, you don't have to declare every variable. But now if this, when you mean, when they, if implicit uh, long is, you, if you don't use that one, does this mean that you have to declare every variable in Fortran or it's not? But it, it won't quite be that drastic. Um, it will be the default. So implicit none will be the default behavior. But if you still want to use the implicit typing rules, you can still use the implicit statement to say, I want variables starting from A to A to, what is it? Uh, a through H. A through H are real and A through H and what is it? Uh, P through Z. O, o to Z. You want to say that, you still are allowed to say that. That's Part is not being made obsolete. It's that you won't have to say implicit none anymore if that's what you want. That just becomes the default behavior. Okay, I see. So it becomes like by default, it looks like more like a say allow. You have to declare everything. Yeah. Then it's... if you don't want to declare every every variable, then you can use that implicit such such such. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's changing the default behavior, not removing that functionality. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was saying uh, we're going to get some version of asynchronous tasks somewhat akin to the way OpenMP has uh, OpenMP task. Uh, so we'll start to get some similar functionality built into the Fortran language. Um, there's some additions for some C interoperability stuff. Um, uh, one that I was interested in is if you use polymorphism at all, it doesn't really function inside pure procedures. But if you want to use do concurrent, which is kind of the native like equivalent to OpenMP parallel do, um, 
you have to have pure procedures if you're going to call any procedures inside of that. You have, they have to be pure, which meant that you can't use polymorphism in multi-threaded code, but uh, there's going to be an extension to the language to enable that. Um, there's work on kind of standardizing the preprocessor. So most of the existing code uses something that looks like the C preprocessor. And so Fortran is going to try and standardize that as, um, you know, take the most common subset and the simple and a relatively simple set of the features of the C preprocessor and kind of standardize how that works with Fortran. Um, including some intrinsics for asking what's the location in the source code. Uh, let's see, we're going to get some more like namespace-like functionality in terms of uh, instead of having to use and use only and do rename things uh, if things have the same names from different modules, we'll get some like access specifier to say like like C++ is double colon or Python by default and you say import module foo or import foo and then everywhere you say foo dot thing. Um, you'll be able to use a functionality that looks a little bit like that. Uh, there will be a way of kind of specifying what are the default kind values for things instead of the, uh, some compilers had, a, had an option to say, well, I want things that are default real to be double precision, which made things non-portable and non-conforming in, in certain aspects. Um, but this this will be kind of a way of saying, hey, the default, if if I didn't say real kind double precision, then I want real to mean double precision throughout this section. So there will be kind of a standard way of saying, no, the things that don't say are double precision, not, not single precision. Um, we've got templates are on the list. Um, if you've ever used the co-array features, they explicitly exclude any kind of use of polymorphism. Um, so we're going to try and extend and allow for some of that stuff. Um, there were just a handful of IEEE functions that weren't included as intrinsics in the language. So we're just going to go ahead and add, add those. Um, there, there has been some addition of some rank agnostic features, so like any rank array, so uh, 1D, 2D, 3D arrays. Um, we're going to try and expand the number of things you can do with those. Um, there was a request for a feature that like FFT packages kind of rely on pretty frequently, which is complex arrays are just arrays of reels that are twice as long and the real part, imaginary part, real part, imagine. Um, there's there's a handful of libraries that just kind of rely on that behavior being true, and ninety nine point nine nine percent of the time it is. So there's uh, would there be a standard? There's there's some interest in a standard conforming way to write code that relies on that behavior. Um, the atomics currently only are usable on code arrays, and that seemed like an odd restriction. So we're going to try and lift that. And then there were a few features that didn't have um, broad interest from the committee. It wasn't clear that these were, you know, that that there was enough interest in these, um, but they've been kind of conditionally accepted. So. Scan is an operation on an array where um, you, you perform an operation and you return another array where it's like, if I've got the array one, two, three, and I apply the plus operation, the first or the first answer is one, the second answer is three, because I add the two together, then it's nine or six, because I then add from the previous result. But uh, these, are, these are an operation that is often parallelizable in ways that a uh, compiler could take advantage of and is really hard to write as, uh, you know, uh, and we don't want everybody to have to rewrite these. So that there's some rationale for wanting to add that as an intrinsic procedure. Um, 
unions are a, a concept from C, um, and there's some interest in being able to declare, like bind C derived types in Fortran. We can already declare bind C types in Fortran that are equivalent of structs in C. But we don't have the equivalent of union. Um, so there's some interest in adding something like that. Uh, there's also some insistence that this breaks type safety, which it kind of does. Um, this would bring back something like equivalence, where you could say two variables of different types share the same space in memory. So what happens when you say that, you know, it, it was always unclear what, what that means when I say that the, this real and this integer share the same space in memory. Well, if I say that uh, that integer equals 42, I have no idea what the equivalent value in a uh, floating point representation is going to be. Um, this lets you do the same thing. C, C lets you do this, but uh, uh, Fortran can't interop with, interoperate with uh, with functions from C that take things that look like that. Um, and then there's also some interest in uh, having the collective procedures, which are uh, a co-array Fortran type thing, um, be able to specify a team rather than have them operate on all of the images of the current team. Anyway, um, that's, the, that's the current list. Uh, if there's any interest in more detail on any of those, you can ask questions now or feel free to send me a message or um, you can always go to uh, the, the document that defines these is available on the WG5 Fortran site. Yeah, G? Um, maybe I asked this question early. Um, so like, a, like some basic matrix operation is it to, is going to plan like a just matrix multiplication, and make inverse of a matrix, um, basically like a, even maybe FFT can always be put like a, as kind of intrin as like intrinsic function of like a Fortran. Uh huh. So matmul is an intrinsic function. Um, matrix inversion is not an intrinsic function. And there is a degree to which the committee has started to become hesitant of adding more intrinsic functions and because they do add some amount of cost to maintaining the, the standard, right? Because every new intrinsic function is another thing we have to double check to make sure it works within any feature in the language. So, uh, but that's what libraries are for, right? We, we have BLAS and LAPLAC and, and FFTW, and you know we, we have these libraries because there is a need for them. They don't necessarily have to be defined as intrinsic procedures in the language because you can write them as, as library procedures. So this is my experience with some of these libraries, even FFTW uh, is like actually, it's, uh, you have to, Get it from somewhere. I have written like a four or five uh, codes in our community for uh, in a, a part of our accelerator community, uh, mm -hmm. all in Fortran. Mm -hmm. uh, I want this code, th those those codes to be portable, so the user, once they download this code, they can directly just compile then compile each other and run it. Yep. So by connecting to some external Say if it's too much de depends on the external library, then I have to tell the users go to where to find the library. That's why I didn't uh, in the code uh, anything in my code I didn't even use the FFTW. I have a version on the Lersk there is you can use FFTW, but it's mm -hmm. not in the open source the GitHub version because I want the user whoever download that package then it, by whatever a standard Fortran compiler like mm -hmm. G Fortran. They can immediately compile the code and run the code. Right, but there is no other language that does that that does that. And 
brings everything into the language rather than have people rely on external libraries. Right, it's, right. That, you, you are right. Languages have developed tools to help you manage your dependencies. And, you are right in, in a sense. You're right. That's people need a library. I don't mean we don't need a library. What I mean is that they need to, from my experience about to say, say the Fortran, you see they get, why they, the question is how the Fortran can get more use, uses usage or whatever the users without mm -hmm. the more usage the way like, i'm very concerned about i'm becoming a dinosaur in our community the people they they're all kind of well, even in my group itself when i talk about the fortran codes they 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 all kind of think that fortran well is yeah. an old one so so then you think about the success of matlab i i, I really want if you i use the fortran i i used to say and c plus plus and also python and also the people love the, there is another things like a Julia is getting popular. You, mm -hmm. you look across all those languages, you think, what's the future of Fortran? How they so why why people were come to use Fortran? I mean, mm -hmm. now the, the popular Python is so popular, a lot of students they, they just use Python. Uh, mm -hmm. with all these Python packages, they don't want to so so how can the Fortran sur survive? I, I found that like at least if MATLAB has this functionality of our MATLAB, but MATLAB is commercial software. Why mm -hmm. can't all those linear algebra, all this, a lot of linear algebra operations can be put into the Fortran as a direct intrinsic function? So this is a huge part of the rationale while, why I helped start the Fortran package manager. Um, about four, a little over four years ago, I went, I am starting to write open source Fortran libraries and declaring them as dependencies and how you go get them and how you compile them and how you install them is a pain. Other languages make this super easy. If you use Python, you go pip install thing. And now I can just do Python. I can just do import thing, right? right. Uh, like there are a dozen languages that made this super easy. Well, let's follow in their footsteps and make that easy. So the Fortran package manager is is getting very popular. It's working very well. Um, the standard library project is practically a built-in dependency for Fortran at this point. So if you use the Fortran package manager as your build system, it will go get and compile your dependencies for you. I see. Oh, that's nice. It's hands down simpler than make files. And in the vast majority of cases, even simpler than CMake. Like there's just nothing to say. Okay. Um, I can I can show you examples of, of projects where I have half a dozen dependencies and the Fortran package manager configuration file is 10 lines long. Right? Okay. And it's building thousands, maybe a hundred thousand lines of Fortran code. And it does it in parallel. It goes and fetches those dependencies for me. Like we've gotten this aspect working and the ecosystem is growing really fast too. There's a handful of uh, people who are keeping some lists. Uh, there's a group working on an official registry that's gonna like host those packages. Because right now you have to say, oh, it's this GitHub repository over there. But um, yeah, no, we're we're making very good progress. I have a lot of hope that in the next two or three years, people will be using FPM and think that Fortran is just as convenient as Python when it comes to, oh, there's a library over there for that. Oh, that's great. Yes. I found like this kind of convenience and, and easy to use. Is a, it, it's a, a very important for a lot of beginners uh, for the users from the user point of view. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. That's that's why there's a group of us uh, taking on the effort to to improve that situation. Any other questions? All right, well, hearing none, thank you all for attending the fun office hours for July. 
Um, I'll stop the recording now. If I can find the right button, stop recording. Yes, Helen.